and you just, it's so hard to stay awake when this person is just like, Ready. That was the Dvorak string quintet. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's, like, the, that's the kind of uh, what I'm listening to, too. Yeah, it's quartets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got yeah, right, you, you get it. I totally. I didn't just make that up. <laughs> I don't know if Dvorak's ever written a string quintet. I'm such a poser. <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Thinking with Mike, and today we are going to be doing something that I don't enjoy doing, is giving other people a voice. Heaven forbid. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I got Will Heller on today. He's What's our up? marketing director, aka Big Cheese. In the flesh, yeah. And we're going to learn a little bit about what he does, and what he sees from the perspective that's not mine, which is quite tunnel vision most of the time, right? That's why he keeps me around. That's right. I have no idea what to expect from this, so let's go. <laughs> that's good. He's still but before we get into the questions, please like, comment, and subscribe. You, you know the drill. He does it anyway. You just get to benefit <laughs> from it. Right. All right, so let's just start in with a, with a really like good one. From yeah. your perspective, where's the biggest errors that sellers make? Um, acting on fear or allowing fear to drive the decision-making process. Like what? Like so many times I've seen sellers as soon as like the reality sets in of how much work goes into selling a home they panic they either like overwork themselves or they start having these weird unrealistic demands about things or they just start making these weird decisions that make everyone's life more difficult rather you know, than you know allowing the trained professional to you know do what they need to do right that's a really cool perspective and um I guess that I've just kind of taken that for granted over time, but like you're absolutely right. As soon as the nuts and bolts and wheels start turning, historically, I think people lose track of where they're going mm -hmm. and they get stuck about the crap in front of them and the work to be done and they forget about where they're going. Yeah, and I feel like as an agent, there's almost an extent to which you have to like get used to it, right? Well, I think we do get used to it and maybe that's like, that's, and that's why I wanted to have you here is because you have the perspective is that I get so used to like, I know where we're going. Yeah. Right? Yeah, impulse decisions panicking don't, don't do it but can you sell without those things yes <laughs> you absolutely can yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i mean for some people it's a driving factor i've always been a kind of a nervously motivated individual but yeah. but yeah it's when it gets out of control and gets unregulated when you notice a seller getting into that that headspace that panic that tunnel vision do you have any tools that you use or yeah i think generally speaking um well i've bought and sold a lot of houses personally mm -hmm. and so i'm no stranger to these feelings i've just been them and i've done the reps right um so when you can see that you can t you can either barrel through it and act like it doesn't exist mm -hmm. or you can stop the conversation and say i'm noticing some hesitation or some fear mm -hmm. and you bring that crap on the table and uh, I found that as the closer you can bring these things to you, the less scary they become, right? Okay. Um, so we just try to talk through them, right? And then mm -hmm. we also uh, talk about worst case scenarios, which are never really that bad. So, so you find that people respond well to like being, for lack of a better term, being called on it? Yeah, being given a platform to discuss what they're feeling, mm -hmm. totally. Nice. Right? And as soon as we can do that, then all that's on the table for the whole transaction. And you don't have to hide your fear from me and you can just bring it and we'll bring, we'll go through it because I know how to overcome everything. Love that. But that's where the experience comes in is being able to have an answer for all the problems that come up. Mm -hmm. You can answer whichever one first. What's the best thing you think agents do? And what do you think is the, the, the biggest mistakes agents make? Mm -hmm. I'll modify that. The best thing a good agent does is teach. Not just necessarily being this taskmaster of, you know, bossing the client around and telling them that they should be doing things this way and they should be, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but rather like being more present in that process and using that as a means by which to educate a seller or even a buyer, right? A first time home buyer is going in, they have no idea what they're doing. What's the best thing an agent can do for them? Teach them about the process, right? And that hopefully mitigates that fear element that we talked about that you know, better prepares them for future transactions. So if, you know, with any luck, they come back to you for their next transaction, they kind of know what they're doing a little more, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know, the biggest mistake that I see agents make, I think it's the same thing. It's allowing fear to be what drives their decision-making process, right? Just like a seller can panic and freak out during the, 
the process of prepping their home for the market, right? An agent as well can also like lock up and panic during negotiations. That can cloud their judgment, you know, it kind of can get in the way of executive functioning and ultimately result in them not making the decision that's best for their client. Hell yeah. That's a big one. And I think that's something that just comes from experience is that letting loose of that fear, being always ready, willing, and able to put the deal directly in the trash can mm -hmm. and starting from square run, right? Mm. And I guess that's where that fear probably comes from is I'm afraid of putting that deal in the trash can because that's something I don't want to do. I want to keep that. I want to hold that, mm -hmm. whether it's right, wrong, or the other thing for anybody else. So that's very interesting. Yeah, and even if that's what needs to happen to that deal, if that deal was just doomed from the start and the only good place for it is, you know, like you said, in the trash can, that agent will still hold on to it because they see that as failure, yeah. even if it is the best case scenario. What's crazy is that things become more clearly when you always give the consumer the, the feeling that you're behind them. And don't worry, we can move on at any time if this doesn't feel right. It actually gives the consumer wings to see clearly because they don't feel like they're being pressured into something. They feel like they're being advised to make a good decision, mm. right? When everything's on the table, proceeding something in the middle or chucking it, that trust actually presents itself for the first time. Yeah, and that's where that like education element comes in too, totally. right? You get to be their guide, their mentor. And that's hard. So you really have to, as oh, yeah. you get used to this, it's like riding a bike, right? When you're just learning how to ride a bike, it's all the moving pieces, like you're feeling and you're thinking about them. And then pretty soon you get on the bike and you just go. So as you get experience in real estate, it can be hard to talk about pedaling the bike, right? The proverbial bike. So what, what I've done and what I see a lot of good agents do is that they focus on the things that are really um, interesting to them mm -hmm. and they educate through those. So as I'm doing showings, I'm talking about all the things with the house and all the process and I talk about, and I nerd out in the things like in the subtext throughout like the transaction that I think is really fun and interesting. And that kind of adds the, the fire for me to be educational mm -hmm. and it also becomes interesting and not like I'm just repeating a broken record, right? If that makes sense. It does, I love that. Yeah. What's the most shocking thing the most shocking thing, General? Sure. Yes. Uh, I shouldn't have cut you off. That's a very <laughs> broad and loaded question. I don't In know, murder? The <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty shocking. All right. Um, I don't know. I don't like horror movies. I don't like jump scares. Yeah, I feel you. I find those shocking. I think it messes with your brain. What was the sh most shocking thing? Like, if you can think of something today, um, when you when you dipped into real estate, which you're pretty new to that still, right? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, what was something that the way that it works that you wouldn't have thought? That's an interesting one. I think. I mean, in general, like just the amount that goes into the average transaction. Um, like I, it took me so long to figure out how contingencies worked. Yes. I still don't get title work. That's still like the one facet of this whole thing that I, I'm glad that there are people that know how to do it and that I don't have to be one of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, like how much goes into it, how many people are involved. Yeah. Just the scale of it. I think, you know, I think you're absolutely right about that. It's, it's absolutely incredible at how much a simple, simple real estate transaction cascades into just like probably what, 20 households by the time you're done with it. Oh yeah. That's cool. And I think the finances of it, just the numbers that we throw around financially, That's like the weird. scale of these transactions, how much money is changing hands. I was talking with Shelby, our social media person this morning, and I threw out like a number of, you know, a commission rate and she just about fell out of her seat. Yeah. Right. Just because the, the scale, the amount of money that I just kind of was like, Oh yeah, it's, you know, a million bucks. Yeah. Right. Whatever. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. it starts to roll up and that's when yeah. it starts to become hard. So when you talked about like the education piece for consumers and buyers, that's the hard part where, it, because it starts to roll off and become a part of just your day to day. And you just get, you understand the sea of things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And so to take a step back from this perspective, um, that takes effort. That is, to go back to even the first question, one of the things that can freak sellers out is like, oh, there's title, and then there's yes. you know, all these different things that they have to start thinking about. It's not just you list the home, you find a buyer, you sign some papers, and you're good. Right? Well, it's, and that's also where education can go sideways. You can't over explain things because then all of a sudden they think that they have to handle all this stuff when mostly speaking, like we got it, oh, right? Oh, yeah. So if you overcomplicate your selling meetings, um, Buyer meetings are pretty easy, right? You can educate all the stuff and it's, it's 
pretty transactional. Mm -hmm. um, but the sell side, if you start dipping into all the crap that we're about to do, it's just an avalanche of work. And yeah. instead you need to simplify it down to a very concise like action plan of one, two, and three, and we're moving on. And then we handle all the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. So education can actually kill you there. Gotcha. Yeah, I never thought about that. I've, I've lost a lot of, I went on a streak where I was like laying out our whole marketing plan and I just kept losing, 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 losing. And then I just took it off the table and just basically, don't worry, we got it. Mm. And um, the stress melted away. Yeah, you focus on packing, painting a couple rooms. And as far as like those things, like, don't worry, I got the guys, like, we'll handle it for you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I love that. That's yeah. that less is more approach that so many people like don't think of. It's hard enough to move. Oh yeah. Like moving is hard. Oh yeah. It's hard to make it easy and more I've simple. done it enough times. Right? Yeah. <laughs> And I'll do it again. And too. when you're young, it's easy. You just have a bin, right? And you just go bin, bin, <laughs> yeah. bin. Living out of a Rubbermaid for like <laughs> five years. Been there. Why did we get away from that? That's easy. Oh, yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> All right, moving on. So these iPhones have this new mute click button. Yep. Which is impossible to forget to turn off mm -hmm. or back on. Having your phone on mute is like professional suicide, I feel like. Kind of, but it's also not really. That's good. Um, dude, there's people out there who do that and they, they operate at like, and when I talk about like the fear is a consumer would get a hold of you and if you don't answer, you lose that deal, right? Mm. Man, that's a rough consumer, right? Yeah. That's brutal. It is. Like, yeah. It, it so is. like, do you want that person in your life? Like if I'm sitting down and eating dinner with my family and they call and then I get put into their, their trash can, like pretty dangerous. Like obviously we get back to people quickly, but I don't think you need to answer every phone call. I have to convince a lot of my clients to call, to call me when they want to because they want to not interrupt my life. Mm. I'm like, dudes, like, don't worry. I'm not going to answer if I'm at the dinner table, but I'll get back to you. Like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. It's like, I know better than to, yeah. you know, drop important things, your more the important first, things. Right? Sorry to call you right now. I'm like, you guys, like if I pick up the phone, like that means that I wanted to talk with you. Like, yeah. is this a good time? <laughs> it's like, I picked up, didn't Wouldn't I? Wouldn't have answered it, right? Call me and I'm very easy to no, get a hold No, this is a of. terrible time to click, right? <laughs> it's so weird. Uh, but you'd be surprised a lot of prospects do that. Like they answer and they go, oh, wait, I'm at work. It's like, what the f Yeah, that, hmm. So that, that does happen. Yeah, see, it's funny because like I'm on the opposite end. I would be that client who's like, I'm not interrupting something, am I? Like, right. <laughs> so anyways, you'd know if you were, right? <laughs> Moving on. That wasn't even a question. I know. More of a rant. Kind of That's good. Ramble. Ooh, what's your favorite thing to do at work? Definitely not ping pong. That's not it. Yeah, okay. That's no. good. <laughs> I think just working with the other people on the marketing team. Come on. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, fine. Seeing nice houses. There you go. Well, yeah. well that doesn't have to be right either. <laughs> yeah, that, well, is, like, that is actually right. That's kind of one of my favorite things to do is go see, okay. like, you know, when we have a multi-million dollar listing, yeah. going and checking it out. Cool. Right. Do you have a favorite that you've been in? Mm, probably a tie between the beachcomber <laughs> listing we had and your Carver Parkway. I just you like, know me. I'm a I classical like artist. I love that. I with my that. colleagues. That's your answer. I do. <laughs> I like building them up and watching them be good at what they do. See, it's now a that's good a good feeling. answer. That's a good answer. That's a damn it's, good feeling, yeah, right? That's the reason why feeling. we show up. It's, it's such nice. a great feeling. It's why I'm so thankful to be in the position that I'm in. Totally, yeah. right? And I'm not just saying it because there's two of them right here. No. Yeah. <laughs> you grow Oops, and do and build together. Wall. I mean, there's nothing finer than that, right? When yeah. you're self-elevating at work, I think that you're off track and that's going to turn into a chore pretty quick. But if we're elevating everybody around us now, that's a whole different story. That's fun. Yeah, I think cool. that's how we've gotten to the point that we're at as a team, right? Yep. Is because we we're not self gratifying, self elevating, right? We, yeah. We're always intentionally working for everyone's success, right? Yeah. Cool. Good answer. Yeah. Houses are fun to look at though, too. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah. <laughs> What's your least favorite? I'm gonna have two more questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's your least favorite thing to do at work? Um. See, I'm the kind of person that like needs time to like think about questions and come up with a good answer, which is really not good for this kind of thing. Uh, what is my least favorite thing to do at work? Um, deal with a broken coffee machine. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> so... That's not it. Um, I, I just like busy work, I would say. Yes. Or anything that... Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Nope. That's sweet. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to get all sappy here. Anything that like makes me feel like I'm not necessarily adding value to the team in that moment, even if I am. Yeah. Task work. 
Yeah. Interesting. But everyone's got it, right? There's no avoiding it. Well, I don't know. Maybe there is. No, you, I don't know. That's <laughs> <laughs> maybe there is. You, you're right. You got me. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there is. <laughs> but, so when yeah. I was a poker dealer in Las Vegas, this is on the topic of you being put on the spot. And I don't know if this is relevant for this or not. I don't know if it is. We'll find out. I don't really care if it is, I guess, because I like telling this story. Uh, but the, when I worked for Harris Casino, they had they, you'd go to panel during their hiring process. And you'd go into this thing. You'd sit 10 people around the circle, and there'd be two like hiring people there. And they'd ask you a bunch of weird shit questions, right? Mm -hmm. Make you all roar like lions and like do weird shit to see how your entertaining value was and like thinking on your toes. And I came into this thing, and there's 10 of you, right? Um, and somebody had given me a tip of like what they were gonna ask you on the spot. And you had to have an answer like frickin' that. And it was gonna be think of a movie, and impersonate the character in a movie, and then we'll guess who they are, and then you'll tell us why you picked them from like a quality perspective. That's got layers. Now that is like, and then think of coming up with that like on the spot. So typically you'd have 10 people to think about it, and I had gotten a tip on this question and then I was called number one. And oh, it was no. like the most like get out of jail card I can ever remember because I already had it. I was Forrest Gump, right? And that's super easy to impersonate. Nice. You know what I mean? Okay. But like, then I went around the circle and watched the people who hadn't gotten it and like, it was ruthless. Yeah. Well, total blank space. And once you get into that blank space, like then you're really gone. Oh and yeah. And you're done. And then <laughs> when you're done with this panel, it was just cutthroat. Cause there's 10 of you and then they just said, all right, I need X, Y, Z and W to get up and they have to get up in front of you. And they just like, get Ooh. escorted out. They're just, they're gone. And they go, congrats, you guys made it. <laughs> Dudes are just getting <laughs> like, getting fucked for fun. And they haven't even left the room yet. No, they like pull them out and then obviously give them the okay, bad gotcha. news. But like it immediately becomes known that like you guys did it. And those guys are like, not. <laughs> no. Off with you. Right? Yeah. So anyhow, that's getting hired at Harris Entertainment. Dang. And Rough. You have so right? many stories from that too. It's that weird. Time. But yeah. So, but that dead spade is re is really. Uh, I think it's something you just need to practice. Oh yeah, it's a skill. And I I have the luxury in my line of work that I don't necessarily have to be on my toes 100% of the time. Like I have the time to be calculated and mm -hmm. and take the time necessary to do that. But. Totally. One piece of advice to your 20 year old self. Hmm. Chill out. I was, up until honestly fairly recently, I was just so, I had such a, I think that's why so many of my answers tonight have been like centered around the idea of fear is because that's something that I, even within the last few years, kind of grappled with. Where I, I learned through experience that letting fear drive your decision making process does nothing for you. In fact, it hurts you and it tears you down to the point of being physically ill for weeks on end. And I. Do not miss that. Do you think your 20-year-old yeah. self would listen? No, because <laughs> my because my 24-year-old self needed to figure it out. Yeah. In the way that I did, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wish I could. As much as I wish I could, you know, just beat myself over the head with understanding. Yeah, I think the reason I'm here now is because of the sequence of events that led up to it. Oh yeah. People go their whole lives without figuring that out, by the way. Sucks to be them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. By the ripe old age of a 27 and a half, you figured it out. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you did it. You got it. You got me. This whole video is leading up to that one moment. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. All right. We good? Thanks for coming on, man. This Thanks, was fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This yep. was, uh, I learned a lot here. Good. I enjoyed it. This was great.